So today, we're going to talk a little about a foundation principle in the Bible student's belief system, and that is the special uh, significance that Bible students give to the Great Pyramid. Now, this is something of long-standing tradition with Bible students. Charles Taze Russell, who back in the early 1880s uh, began writing what uh, he called eventually the Studies in the Scriptures series. Initially, it was called Millennial Dawn, but he wrote six volumes of the Studies in the Scriptures, and in volume four, uh, he explained uh, the Great Pyramid and its passageways and how they had a, a spiritual uh, significance and that in some way God had the Great Pyramid built uh, specifically to provide uh, a witness to God's plan of salvation. And he uses a scripture in Isaiah and this scripture uh, talks about a stone witness that is in the midst of the land and on the border thereof. And that particular scripture is Isaiah 19.19. And it reads, In that day... There will be an altar to the Lord in the heart of Egypt and a monument to the Lord at its border. Uh, this is a, um, a uh, more modern English version. Uh, I believe it is the uh, American Standard Version of the Bible. Um, it's not, certainly not the King James, but um, this is the scripture... Um, used by uh, Russell to authenticate the um, Great Pyramid as having a scriptural basis uh, in, in, in the Bible and uh, that it um, is part of God's overall plan of... Um, salvation. And so much so uh, did he believe that, that he actually uh, included the um, Great Pyramid in his dispensational chart uh, called the uh, Chart of the Ages. And as you can see in this chart of the ages, um, several features. Uh, first, you see these arcs. Uh, these arcs represent dispensations or periods of time. Uh, the first dis dispensation was uh, from the time of Adam to the flood, and uh, that uh, constituted the first dispensation and that um, period included Adam and Eve and, um, and all of those people that lived 900 years, including Methuselah and Noah and Noah and his uh, sons and their wives and so on. So um, that, that's that first period. The second dispensation uh, is the middle arc uh, in the in the uh, chart, um, it's easy to see. It says dispensation second, and 
Um, in this uh, dispensation, that is what we call the present evil world. Um, and it has various sub-ages in it, one uh, called the Patriarchal Age, which had the um, uh, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob uh, was represented in that. Then there was the uh, Jewish Age, in which God dealt with Israel under the law. That's the second arc uh, from the left in the uh, second dispensation. And then there is this uh, complex <laughs> uh, arc with all kinds of overlaps. Um, uh, that is the, uh, the gospel age. And that age starts with uh, Jesus and, uh, and ends. Uh, there, there are two harvests represented, and uh, these overlaps... Uh, represent uh, the fact that uh, uh, Russell couldn't keep the numbers nice and neat and all ending in one place, um, which um, uh, became troublesome. Um, and now the Jehovah's Witnesses under Judge Rutherford, uh, they had everything end in uh, 1914. Uh, Russell had various dates. He had 1874, uh, as the um, invisible uh, second coming of Jesus Christ, and uh, 1878 as the uh, time when Jesus was uh, crowned king, and uh, what the uh, we the Bible students called the uh, raising of the sleeping saints, and then 1914, which was the uh, end of Gentile times or the end of Gentile dominion over Israel. And all of this ultimately is uh, to culminate in the third dispensation, which is supposedly uh, to include the thousand-year kingdom and, um, and uh, the forever beyond. Uh, when the world is restored to perfection and uh, <clears throat> time immemorial forever and ever and everybody lives in peace, happiness, and all that stuff. And they call that the ages to come. And you can see a little slice of the uh, ages to come. Now, in this, it's quite obvious that uh, we have these pyramids in here. And uh, the pyramids are um, uh, drawn in line uh, with the uh, tabernacle uh, because uh, Russell believed that the Great Pyramid uh, represented a, uh, or was a stone representation of uh, the divine plan of the ages. In other words, uh, this chart of the ages was contained within the pyramid itself. And you can see uh, very complicated uh, uh, parts of pyramids that are falling and crooked and uh, uh, the top stone that uh, suddenly finds its way on a completed pyramid in the uh, millennial age or the, the under the third dispensation. And it got all complicated and complex. And this is the simple version, because uh, Russell influenced uh, two individuals uh, from Scotland, uh, John and Morton Edgar, who were devoted followers. In fact, John Edgar was mentioned in uh, Russell's will as being uh, someone who Russell felt should be on the editorial committee. Uh, when uh, when Russell, or if in the event Russell died. So uh, Charles Taze Russell was a pyramid freak. And in fact, he was so much a pyramid freak uh, that he um, used a pyramid uh, as... Um, <laughs> as his uh, as a uh, headstone, or not exactly a headstone, uh, but a grave marker. And in this grave marker, uh, you can see 
that uh, there is a cross and crown near the top of the pyramid, and you could see that the uh, capstone of the pyramid is uh, delineated uh, from the rest of the uh, the pyramid, and uh, the uh, books that uh, are carved into the side of this pyramidal stone, um, I guess, uh, represent the, the scriptures themselves. And there is uh, the cross and crown, which was the symbol of the Bible student movement during Russell's time. And in fact, uh, Bible students uh, continue to use the uh, cross and crown as uh, a symbol uh, for the movement. And so if you go to a Bible student convention in front of the podium, you'll see a cross and crown. Uh, many will wear cross and crown pins. Um, and so uh, when I was uh, uh, baptized and consecrated, uh, I was given a gift of a golden cross and crown pin, uh, which uh, was uh, to denote that I was one of the brethren. Now, the Great Pyramid actually is um, not uh, of anything um, in the, the scriptures. That, that Isaiah scripture, Isaiah 19.19, is ra rather tentative in its uh, interpretation. If, if one uh, were to say, um, uh, let's say a scripture that said, there, there, I will place a stone pyramid in the, uh, in, uh, the land of Giza, uh, and this stone pyramid is going to represent um, my plan of the ages, uh, then maybe uh, you could say that there is some scriptural backing for the for the Great Pyramid as as having any uh, biblical uh, connection, but uh, there isn't any such uh, biblical um, uh, tie, and uh, that one is relatively tentative if <laughs> uh, when you when you think about it. But the, the pyramid is such a huge thing amongst the Bible students. Uh, when I was a kid, um, Bible students, uh, there were two uh, individuals um, uh, passed away now um, uh, that during the 1960s uh, and the 1970s uh, sponsored tours uh, to the Great Pyramid and uh, they would arrange for uh, Bible student trips uh, to the land of Egypt and to the Holy Land. Um, and um, they would go uh, crawling around in the Great Pyramid and uh, they would uh, uh, explain their latest theories on uh, the pyramid. And uh, these two uh, individuals, I, I will not give their names, um, uh, but were renowned within the Bible student movement as being the definitive experts of the um, of the uh, Great Pyramid um, at at um, at the time of Charles Russell. It was uh, Doctor John Edgar and his brother Morton. Uh, John Edgar died. Um, uh, earlier or uh, before his brother uh, did. And um, Morton Edgar, um, because uh, Rutherford rejected the pyramid in, um, in the, the later 1920s, um, Morton Edgar uh, associated more with the uh, Bible students uh, factions that uh, were regrouping. And I believe Morton Edgar died sometime around 1950, but he, 
he had written uh, a number of things. Uh, I believe there were several books uh, written by uh, he and his brother and then uh, by Morton uh, alone after his brother died. And uh, during the time of Russell, uh, they were quite prominent um, in uh, the uh, Watchtower Bible and Tract Society uh, for their, uh, for their um, in-depth analyses of the uh, Great Pyramid and all of the measurements that they did and so on. But uh, why Russell became uh, interested in the Great Pyramid to begin with was as a result of uh, two individuals in the uh, earlier part of the 19th century. Um, uh, one was uh, a British uh, publisher by the name of John Taylor, uh, who was a religious fanatic, and he he had written a uh, book about the Great Pyramid and how um, its particular measurements uh, could not be um, of of any um, chance uh, by any by any um, um, uh, random. Uh, uh, you know, uh, any any random um, uh, event that um, this was something that was inspired uh, by God Himself, and um, the astronomer Royal uh, of Scotland, uh, Charles uh, Piazzi Smythe. Um, and this is, uh, you know, not everybody with the title of doctor uh, can uh, necessarily be uh, considered a scientist uh, just because they have the, the title and just because uh, they may uh, not operate a uh, telescope. Uh, it doesn't necessarily mean that, they, um, that they, they're truly uh, scientists. And that was uh, certainly the, the case uh, with Smythe, who was um, absolutely taken by the uh, Great Pyramid. And he wrote uh, three, uh, uh, as, as uh, Mario Livio um, ad addressed it in his book, uh, The Golden Ratio, The Story of Phi, The World's Most Astonishing Number, uh, which was published in uh, 2002, uh, Mario Livio um, uh, called uh, Charles Piazzi Smythe a uh, crank. And uh, Piazzi, Piazzi Smythe uh, is uh, more noted not only for his uh, pyramidology and his, his um, absolute obsession with the pyramid being uh, something of God's origin, uh, but um, also the one who rejected uh, the um, uh, institution of uh, the metric system within uh, Great Britain uh, because um, of its being of God, uh, that, that, uh, that the inch, or what he called the pyramid inch, which was so close to the British inch, uh, must be um, God-given, and um, and that the uh, that the uh, British uh, th this was a common belief at the time uh, that uh, the Brits themselves were uh, descendants of the ten lost tribes of Israel, and so um, the the pyramid inch or inch was a God-given measurement, and hence. Uh, the metric, um, the metric system um, was um, was, uh, and it, he calls it here. I'll read it um, to prevent that nation unheedingly robbing itself in the accursed thing, in the very garment of the coming of Antichrist, and Esau-like for a little base pottage 
for a little temporary extra mercantile profit, throwing away a birthright institution with our Abrahamic race was intended to keep until the accomplishment of the mystery of God touching all mankind. This was Piazzi's, Smythe's reasoning for not adopting the, <laughs> the metric system. <laughs> Uh, you can find this in um, uh, Mario, Livio, Mario Livio's book. Now, Mario Livio was um, and is uh, an astrophysicist, uh, Israeli-American uh, astrophysicist who has also written uh, many books to popularize mathematics. Uh, the one uh, that I own right now is uh, the, the Golden Ratio, which is uh, quite an interesting uh, subject of its own. Uh, but uh, it's interesting that uh, Livio um, uh, goes into some detail about Charles Piazzi Smythe and the uh, Great Pyramid and why um, this whole business about the Great Pyramid is just... Uh, crank and, and fool, foolery, um, foolishness. And uh, he talks about, uh, this is what he says here. He says, um, uh, the um, few archaeological structures have generated as much myth and controversy as the Great Pyramid. And the preoccupation with the pyramid or of the occult side of pyramidology was, for example, a central theme in the Rosicrucians, who um, were um, were uh, the um, I guess the um, cult uh, or sect uh, from which Freemasonry originated, um, and. Um, they had this. Uh, they had the uh, this um, uh, belief in uh, secrets of nature and magic and stuff like that. And um, and Freemasonry originated from some factions of the Rosicrucian cult. Now, um, the more modern uh, interest in pyramidology started probably with the religiously permeated book of the retired English publisher John Taylor, The Great Pyramid, and why it was built and who built it, which appeared in 1859. Taylor was so convinced that the pyramid contained a variety of dimensions inspired by mathematical truths unknown to the ancient Egyptians that he concluded that its construction was the result of divine intervention. And... Uh, he was influenced by the then fashionable idea that the British were the de descendants of the lost tribes of uh, Israel, the lost 10 tribes. And he proposed, uh, for example, the basic uh, measuring unit of the pyramid was the same uh, uh, unit uh, as used in the Bible, um, the biblical cubit, which is slightly more than 25 British inches or equal to precisely uh, 25 pyramid inches. So he created this thing called the pyramid inch, which was slightly, very, ever so slightly larger than the inch. And this unit uh, supposedly was also one employed by Noah in building the ark and King Solomon in the construction of the temple. Taylor went on to claim that uh, the sacred cubit was divinely selected on the basis of the length of the Earth's center to pole radius, and the pyramid's inch being five a hundred millionth part of the Earth's polar axis. His cranky book, uh, and uh, for um, anybody who's uh, outside of the realms of science and its uh, fiction, uh, is called a crank. Uh, his cranky book uh, found great uh, a great admirer in Charles Piazzi Smythe, the astronomer royal of Scotland, 
who published no fewer than three massive tomes for the, um, the first entitled Our Inheritance in the Great Pyramid, uh, on the Great Pyramid in the 1860s. Uh, Smythe's enthusiasm was motivated partly by his strong objection to uh, attempts to reintroduce the metric system in Britain. His pseudo-scientific theological logic worked something like this. The Great Pyramid was designed in inches. The mathematical properties of the pyramid show that it was constructed by divine inspiration. Therefore, the inch is a God-given unit, unlike the centimeter, which was inspired by the wildest, most bloodthirsty, most atheistic revolution, i.e., the French Revolution, <clears throat> and further describing his views on the uh, system of the measures debate, uh, Smythe writes in The Great Pyramid, Its Secrets and Mysteries Revealed, so that not for the force of space uh, of sparse oratory emitted in the defense of Brit British metrology before Parliament uh, were the bills of the pro-French metri metrical agitators so often overthrown. So he was, now nah, he's noted for having um, uh, overthrown uh, the metric system in Great Britain uh, um, because he believed that the Great Pyramid was, uh, was, inspired by God. When Russell got a hold of Smythe's work, he instantly grabbed a hold of it and thought that, yes, indeed, this, this has to be a work of God. And uh, he contacted Charles Piazzi Smythe and they discussed uh, one another's thoughts. Of course, Russell had his own interpretation uh, and um, his understanding of God's plan of salvation as he uh, patchworked it together from various uh, second Adventists, uh, namely George Storrs, George Stetson, Nelson Barber, um, uh, individuals uh, who preceded him like Henry Grew, um, and, and, and some of William Miller's work. Uh, so, um, actually the Bible student belief system is sort of a Frankenstein patchwork of different beliefs that, that Russell just kind of put together. And, uh, he was not, uh, an original thinker. Uh, he, um, he got these ideas that he promoted and wrote in voluminous um, you know, articles and uh, newspaper sermons and uh, books and uh, Tabernacle Shadows and the six volumes of studies in the scriptures and um, and and the Watchtower magazine. Um, he <laughs> just was a prolific writer, uh, but uh, he he patchworked all of this together from other people's uh, beliefs. He didn't put this together uh, on his own. And when he when he uh, had uh, incorporated uh, the uh, Great Pyramid into his writings. Uh, in the studies of the scriptures and called the Bible, the, um, uh, called the, uh, the, the, the Great Pyramid, the Bible in stone. Um, uh, Charles Piazzi Smythe uh, wrote a foreword uh, to, I believe it was the fourth volume, uh, in which the uh, Great Pyramid was, uh, there was a chapter devoted to the Great Pyramid and its significance and all of the, uh, the measurements. Well, um, unfortunately, over the years, they found that some of the measurements weren't exactly correct. Uh, Flinders uh, Petrie 
uh, had uh, found that many of the original measurements of the uh, of the Great Pyramid were were not correct, and so uh, there there had to be adjustments that were made, and and so Bible students, rather than say, uh, there's uh, this is just the uh, foolishness. Uh, they they adjusted their their beliefs around the the, the new findings, but uh, anyway, um, uh, Livio deals uh, with this, and he deals with uh, people's claims that uh, the Great Pyramid um, had the uh, the the golden ratio uh, involved in it, in that the uh, base of the pyramid. Uh, to the height of the pyramid, the base uh, being uh, on average uh, 755.79, and the height of the pyramid is 481.4 feet. Um, uh, from these values, and by using the Pythagorean theorem, uh, we find that the height of the triangle is uh, 600 and, uh, or the, uh, side of the triangle is, um, uh, 612.01 feet. Uh, we therefore find that the, um, uh, side of the, um, uh, angle by the area is, uh, equal to 1.62, which is extremely close to the difference uh, of the golden ratio by uh, less than 1%, 0.1%. And taken at face value, Livio says, this evidence would imply that the ancient Egyptians uh, indeed knew about the golden ratio since uh, not only does this number appear in the ratio of the dimensions of the Great Pyramid, but its presence seems to be supported by the historical documentation of the intentions of its designers in the form of hereditous statement. But is this true, or are we witnessing what Canadian mathematician and author Roger Hertz Fischler called one of the most ingenious sleights of hand in scientific history? Uh, clearly, the measurements of the, uh, of the dimensions cannot be uh, altered. Only part uh, the only part of this evidence for the presence of the golden ratio that can be challenged is Herodotus' statement. In spite of the numerous repetitions, because the Greeks did know about phi, uh, in spite of the numerous repetitions from the quote from history, and even though one cannot cross-examine a man who lived 2,500 years ago, at least four researchers have taken upon themselves the detective work to investigate what Herodotus really said or meant, and the results of these inquiries have been summarized by Hertz, Fischler, and by the University of Maine mathematician George Markowski. And the original text from Herodotus' history appears in paragraph 124 of book 2 named uh, Euterpe, uh, traditional translations read, its base is square, each side is eight plethora long, and its height the same. Or it is a square, 800 feet each way, and uh, the height the same. Note that one plethron was 100 Greek feet. These uh, texts look very different from what has been presented as a quote. Uh, from uh, Herodotus. Furthermore, the figure, figures for the pyramids to mention that Herodotus mentions are wildly off. The Great Pyramid is far from being 800 feet high, and its height is only about 481 feet, and even the side of its uh, square base, about 756 feet, is significantly less than 800 feet. So, where did that quote come from? Well, the first clue comes from John Herschel's article um, in the Athenium. According to Herschel, it was John Taylor in his book, The Great Pyramid, Why It Was Built and Who Built It, who had the merit of pointing out this property of the pyramid and Herodotus' quote. 
and Hertz Fischler track down the misconception to what appears to be nothing more than a misrepresentation of Hereditus in John Taylor's now infamous book. So um, we can see here that um, that there isn't even uh, really any true uh, basis for the uh, for the uh, um, Great Pyramid having any any spe special significance, even uh, with regard to the um, golden ratio. <laughs> so um here um, it it just simply it's simply bunk and uh all of this all of this business uh regarding um regarding uh the great pyramid and its um its special significance is all as a result of um religious fanatics um even even um, you know Russell just couldn't uh, understand what uh, or differentiate between what what good science was and uh, just because somebody had credentials or uh, supposed credentials, uh, he considered uh, the individual to to be an expert in the field and would quote him and used. Um, uh, Charles Piazzi Smythe, who based all his work on Jan on uh, on John Taylor's um, uh, fanaticism, and uh, you just have this uh, snowball effect, and uh, and so uh, th that's how the Great Pyramid ended up featuring so strongly in uh, the Bible student theology. Uh, there really is nothing to this. It's it's complete. It's a complete myth. However, there is one interesting thing, and that has to do with the age of the uh, Great Pyramid, and uh, and and how they've been able to actually date it with a precision of uh, within five, uh, plus or minus five years. Now, if we take what biblical apologists say, people like Ken Ham or the, uh, in fact, the recent um, JW um, video um, uh, with David uh, uh, Splain, uh, said that uh, the flood itself, the great flood of Noah, you know, with the uh, uh, beavers eating uh, the the wood. Yeah, that's a that, that's a pretty good uh, 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 problem. You know, there there were there were animals that uh, that ate wood. <laughs> that could be problematic on a wooden boat. Um, uh, as you can see here, Noah's Ark is a little bit packed, and uh, Noah um, doesn't look like he has a, a whole lot of room for uh, uh, his food. He's got some crocodiles up on the roof. Um, now, some of the animals were clean animals, uh, like sheep, so that there were seven of those. And uh, there were a bunch of animals that had seven. Uh, but um, anyway... Um, uh, this picture gives you kind of a nice idea of the uh, of the flood, and the Bible apologists say that the flood occurred about forty three hundred years ago, or roughly, let's say two thousand three hundred and fifty B.C. But uh, uh, science uh, has uh, accurately dated the Great Pyramid uh, to um, 2480 BC, which is uh, more than a hundred years before uh, the Great Flood, um, as claimed by uh, Bible apologists. <clears throat> and again, uh, the the there is very little uncertainty. 
And this wasn't done using scientific um, carbon dating, which has come under a lot of criticism by uh, Christians, uh, and um, and it hasn't been uh, established based on records, uh, which um, are incomplete. And uh, and when you when you use carbon dating or uh, any recorded accounts of that that survived from um, uh, ancient Egypt, uh, you get a about um, a uh, statistical uh, variation or uh, standard deviation of uh, about plus or minus. 100 years from the um, the date that that uh, was established uh, by those methods, and so that uh, that actually works out for the Bible apologists. However, there is a far more accurate uh, means by which uh, the the age of the uh, the pyramid. Uh, was identified, and this is very fascinating. It's in Livio's book, and he says, until recently, the dating of the great of the pyramids of Giza relied mostly on surviving lists of kings and their reigns, uh, the length of their reigns, and since these lists are rare and seldom complete, and known to contain inconsistencies, chronologies were generally accurate uh, only to within about a hundred years. Uh, dating by radioactive carbon contains a similar uncertainty. Um, in a paper that appeared in the journal Nature in November 2000, Kate Spence of Cambridge University proposed another method of dating, which gives for Khufu's Great Pyramid a date of 2480 BC, which is is um, 130 years uh, before um, uh, older uh, than the um, than the uh, the claimed great flood, and um, and it has her method um, has an uncertainty of only about five years. So there's a great deal of precision with this this new method, and this is the this is the method that was uh, proposed. Spence's method is the one originally suggested by the astronomer astronomer Sir John Herschel in the middle of the 19th century. So here we have uh, one astronomer who is a real crank. Uh, by the name of Charles Piazzi Smythe, and was a pyramid nut. In fact, actually, uh, the, the <laughs> um, uh, Smythe uh, was uh, called, I love this term, um, by uh, who was that? I have to uh, find that, uh, find that statement. But uh, he was called a pyramid, a pyramidiot. <laughs> I think that's such a great name. It's in the book, uh, Livio's book, um, uh, Pyramidiots. Uh, it, I just I love that. I think that's fantastic. Um, but anyway, um, these are cranks. Uh, Charles P. Otzi Smythe is a crank. And um, but uh, Herschel is not a crank. He is a a, a well reputed uh, 19th century astronomer who was very important uh, to uh, the advancement of uh, our understanding of uh, of the universe. And Herschel proposed uh, that um, that. Uh, based on the fact that the pyramids were always oriented with respect to the north direction with extraordinary precision. For example, the orientation of the Great Pyramid of Giza deviates from true north by less than three minutes of an arc, a mere 5% of one degree. 
There is no doubt that the Egyptians used astronomical observations to determine the north direction with such accuracy. Now, the north celestial pole is defined as a point aligned um, on the a point on the sky aligned with the Earth's rotational axis, around which the stars appear to rotate. However, and this is important, however, the axis of the Earth itself is not precisely fixed. Rather, it wobbles very slowly like the axis of a spinning top or a gyroscope. And as you, uh, if you can recall as a, as a child, um, uh, getting a top and spinning it, uh, you would notice that after uh, the top began to lose some of its speed, that it would begin to wobble. Now that wobbling is called precession. And that's exactly what the Earth does as it rotates on its axis. And I have an illustration of that right here. What you see here in this illustration is the Earth. And the Earth rotates on its axis from the South Pole through to the North Pole. That's that red line and the Earth spins about that line, or axis. But the axis itself is tilted, and everybody knows that the tilt gives us the difference in um, summer, winter, fall, and spring. It gives us our seasons uh, because um, as, uh, as winter approaches in the Northern Hemisphere, uh, despite the fact that we are closer to the sun in our orbit, uh, elliptical orbit, um, the, the angle at which the sun, uh, the, 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 the line of the, the, let's say the, the rays of light that emit from the sun, um, hit at a, um, such an angle as uh, so that there's uh, less density of energy hitting per square foot or meter or whatever um, uh, measurement you want on the surface. Um, and so therefore with less energy uh, per square or unit um, area on, on the surface of the earth, uh, the, the, it's naturally going to be cooler. And with the, um, uh, with the um, uh, Earth tilted, uh, as it's shown here in this picture, uh, toward the sun, uh, you can see that the, the sun's rays are more direct. And, um, and that, that, this is a depiction of uh, summertime in the Northern Hemisphere. And uh, summer and winter are just the opposite in uh, northern and southern hemispheres. Well, the axis around which the Earth uh, spins, you can see the white arrows around the equator uh, depicting the Earth's rotation about that red line um, or the axis, but then you, you look at the top of the figure and you see the, the top of the axis itself spins around. Now that the, re the reason for that is um, the Earth has its moon, which is a pretty large moon for the size of the Earth, uh, competing uh, with the sun uh, in terms of gravitational pull on the planet, and it causes the, the planet to precess uh, cause uh, as it as it rotates about its axis. So this is called axial precession. Um, so the Earth's axis precesses. Now, how long does it take for the Earth to precess around that circle around uh, uh, at the top of that red axis? Well, it takes twenty six thousand years uh, for the Earth to precess uh, fully to make one full circuit 
And um, so the Earth's tilt um, uh, right now is about 23.4, almost 23.5 degrees. And um, as uh, the Earth's axis uh, precesses, uh, it um, uh, the 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 um, axis actually as it's oriented to the plane of Earth's rotation around the sun uh, begins to straighten out and so it, it's less tilted and that affects uh, the climate, that affects um, um, uh, the weather uh, around the globe uh, because of um, the difference in, in the way uh, the sun's energy is striking the earth. Uh, so uh, it has... Um, it has um, profound effects on the on the climate of the Earth, uh, but it's also able to use the um, uh, as a means of dating, uh, because what um, is considered north, we have a star above the uh, axis of the Earth that we call the North Star, and that star is located above the. Uh, directly above, um, we, the star is called Polaris. Uh, we have the, the pointer stars on Ursa Major or the, uh, uh, the, the Big Dipper. And those, uh, the two pointer stars point to the North Star. And uh, the North Star sits over the, uh, the axis. And the North Star has long been understood uh, to, uh, you know, for... Um, use in navigation and uh, and building things and so on. And the ancient Egyptians oriented uh, their uh, pyramids uh, to be at what was due north in their era. And, um, and now uh, we know that that the given the 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 fact that the rotation is constant, the precession of the of the Earth is uh, axis is is constant. Uh, we can, with a great degree of accuracy, know how much uh, the the alignment of the pyramids uh, deviated from what the ancient Egyptians considered to be true north. Uh, in their in their time, to what uh, true what North is today, uh, using um, the stars to guide us, and uh, we can get uh, a very very accurate um, understanding of how long it takes for us to deviate that that, that much in in terms of degrees. Uh, off of north of what would be, be considered due north, and uh, so precise as a, as a matter of fact that um, it it can only be off by five years. So there's throw away this radiocarbon dating argument. Throw away uh, the the, uh, the the there aren't records. We have an astronomical means by which we know for a fact how old the pyramid is, and that it's older, that it was built 130 years before the supposed flood, which is only chronicled in the Bible. And the Bible has is, is, is not got a very good record of, of being accurate or accurately depicting uh, historical fact, at least, uh, uh, at least uh, as as far back as there's no evidence that there was a Moses. Uh, there's no evidence of uh, a nation of Israel being uh, captive in the uh, in in Egypt or uh, two million people uh, wandering around for forty years in uh, in uh, the Sinai Desert. Uh, there's no evidence of any of that, uh, but we know for a fact when the Great Pyramid was built through a very accurate and independent means of um, measurement 
um, from the uh, Bible apologists and critics of the scientific method. So, uh, Herschel, hats off to you. You were truly a great astronomer. Charles Piazzi Smythe, uh, you belong in the realms of the photodrama of creation and Charles Taze Russell and his uh, silliness and, uh, and, um, and, and the crank pseudoscience uh, that was uh, being promoted by um, Smythe and uh, taken up by Russell and the Watchtower Society and um, and uh, anyway, I, I thought that this was uh, an interesting topic. This is something that's really huge amongst the Bible students. Uh, I wanted to show uh, that the Great Pyramid really um, is nothing more uh, than a monument that was built by the Egyptians for other reasons that that they that it has no connection to God, that it is not God's stone witness uh, in the midst of the land and the border thereof. It is not the Bible in stone. So, um, sorry, Charlie, and I mean Charlie, both Charlie Smythe and Charlie Russell. Sorry, Charlie, but you guys are wrong. So this is... Uh, true seeker, uh, wishing you all well.